pastor. Amen. 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 Pastor Mark, God bless you. And I want to send congratulations from our church to yours. Word of Truth Christian Church in Bowling Green, Ohio, about an hour and 20 minutes, I guess, from here. And uh, we just thank you for allowing us to be a part of your church service today. And I can tell you that Miss Tina and Brother Mark are the best there is. Amen, amen. And, and uh, thank you for that, that uh, introduction. I'd like to meet that person. <laughs> um, <laughs> you guys doing all right? Well, I've come today with a purpose. And that is to preach the word of God to you today. So I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea, chapter 10. And I want to talk to you today about revival. I believe Word of Life Christian Church is getting ready for revival. Do you believe that? I believe in the preaching of the Word. I believe that God has a reason for every service. Every song that was sung here today... Everything that you've done, everything that God has done up to this time in 25 years. I believe God has a purpose for this service. And I think God wants to say something. I know you've been preaching, or excuse me, teaching and preaching here even today about faithfulness to God. And I want to talk, his faithfulness to you. His faithfulness to you over 25 years. I want to kind of hit on that faithfulness today regarding us to him. And the title of my message this morning is going to be Praying Through to Faithfulness. But I want to talk to you about preparing myself for revival. We want the rain, but we've got to prepare for the rain. We want revival, but we've got to prepare ourselves for the revival. And so that's what I want to talk about, preparing myself for revival. And I want to title the message... Praying through to faithfulness. And I want to subtitle it, I smell the rain in the house. My mom, she's with the Lord. She died at my dad's funeral. But she always had a way of saying, I can smell the rain. It's coming. Did you know that? You, you've, you've probably had, maybe your parents have said that or someone, I smell the rain. Come. And it wasn't raining, but it, it, the wind way out there was blowing some of that towards us. And she could smell that rain. And it made her run to the backyard and grab everything off the line. <laughs> Amen. Before it rained. And for some reason, I'm like, I don't see any rain. No, you don't, no, you don't, no, you don't see it. But she smelled it. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to let you know, things that are in the wind. I smelled your, your, your mortgage burning. I was downstairs. And when I came up, I smelled. I thought, the place is on fire. <laughs> but I just want to tell you today, God has revival for us. Hosea chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. Listen to what the word says. It says, verse 1, Israel is an empty vine. In the Hebrew, I believe it says, Israel is a luxuriant vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Their heart is divided. Now go with me to verse 12, if you would. Verse 12 says this, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness upon you. I can smell the rain in the house. And I just want to say, may God add his blessing to his word today. Lord, bless your word today into our hearts. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. An old preacher was asked the question, if he thought the church was out of touch with the people in his generation. He replied, No, we are not out of touch with the people in our generation. Our problem is 
that we are out of touch with God. Let me say, when we get in touch with God, then godliness with contentment is great gain. When we get in touch with God, then we will make a covenant with our eyes. When we get in touch with God, we will make a covenant with our ears, with our hands. When we get in touch with God, the altars will become commonplace. The church will become a familiar place. The presence of God will be the most desired place. And the devil will be given no place. Hallelujah. Praise his name. So I want to talk to you, friends. Today we've been told that revival is a sovereign act of God. I do believe God brings revival. I do believe God sends revival. But the Bible still says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. How many see you've got something to do with it? God is sovereign, but he's waiting for us. Amen? Those two things are not incompatible. But we must prepare for the revival. My question is, how can I prepare for my... For the revival in my own life. In my own life. There are three things. Only one of them we're going to talk about today. But let me give you the three things. Number one, we must be willing to be poured out. Number two, we must be willing to press on. And number three, we must be willing to pray through. And today we're going to talk about praying through. You ever heard that phrase? Praying through. It's time for us to begin to pray through. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk to you today about this particular Bible scripture verse. Beginning with verse 1, he says, Israel is an empty vine. There are three things I see in verse 1, verse 2, and verse 12 that help me to prepare myself for revival and praying through. Let's find out what the situation is. Go with me to verse 1. We see, we see the conclusion of the matter. In verse 2, we see the cause of this problem. And number 3, we see the cure in verse 12. Look at verse 1 and see the condition or the conclusion. Let's look, look at verse 1. See the conclusion. The conclusion of the matter is verse 1, and he says this, Israel is an empty vine he brings forth fruit unto himself. How many see the word empty? In the Hebrew it says luxuriant. That sounds like it's contradictory. How can it be luxuriant and empty? I'll tell you how. Because they're bringing forth fruit all right, but they're bringing forth fruit unto themselves. How many of there are churches bringing forth fruit unto themselves? And you might have a whole bunch of fruit. It might be luxuriant. But the truth is, it's empty. So the word empty is right. The word luxuriant is right. Because you can have all the fruit you want. You can say, I've got this and I've got that. We've got numbers. we got money. But I'm telling you, if it, don't, if it doesn't come from God, it's an empty thing. But then he tells us, he tells us, not only do we have the conclusion of the matter, but we have the cause of this matter. Go to verse 2. Verse 2 gives you the cause. I'm going to see verse 2. It says, their heart is divided. That's the reason why people are bringing forth fruit unto themselves. Because their heart is divided. This word divided means smooth smooth how in the world do you get divided from smooth i'm going to tell you how because back then they would have smooth stones and they would take those stones and they would throw them like dice and when they roll them like dice they would use those stones to divide land property garments whatever and they were used to divide things you roll the dice if it comes up seven he gets it if it comes up five she gets it how many know what i'm saying yeah. so what is he saying he says your heart your problem the cause for this is a divided heart in other words ladies and gentlemen their heart became a casino and the problem in the church today is that people have their hearts turned into a gambling house. Yes. What does that mean? That means this. They want God and something else. And they roll the dice. Come on, baby. Come on. It's Sunday morning. And they roll the dice. If it's seven, it's we go to church. 
If it's a five, we go play golf. We want God and something else. And they roll the dice. It's like flipping a coin. Heads, we go to church. Tails, we play golf. Heads, we go to church. Tails, we go to the mall. You see, poor God, he just lost out. But the truth of the matter is, it's not that they hate God. It's just that they've made their heart a casino and they've thrown it off. And what they're saying is this. If it comes up, good. If it doesn't, well, that's the way it is. Now, now, now listen to what I'm saying. We have people in churches today whose hearts have become a casino. They have a divided heart. They want God and something else. If you keep that up to where you want God and something else, it will change to this. You will want something else and then God. And what we want is this. God will have no rivals between him and you or anybody else. The Bible says God will receive the glory for everything. How many know there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in all. Friends, God will share his glory with no one. With no one. So what is the conclusion of the matter? Oh, the conclusion is simply this. They're empty. How did they get that way? Their heart became a casino. I'm going to tell you something. When I grew up, it wasn't heads or tails. We go to church or we don't. It was always heads. It was always heads, pal. And I want to tell you something. I, I didn't like it then. I didn't like it when I was growing up. I didn't like it. I remember one time I told my parents I didn't want to go to church. One. <laughs> Anybody get that? You see, our hearts have been divided. Our love for variety has put God on a list with other things. I'm going to say it again. Our love and our passion for variety in our life has put God on a list with other things. And God is not going to be on a list. He is the one. He is the only one. And I must put him first in my life. Amen? But now we have the cure. How many know God always has a cure? He always has a cure. Look at the cure, verse 12. So he says, this is what you guys got to do. To prepare yourselves for revival. Number one is this. Look at what he says. Verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. That's all one thing. Look at the next one. Break up your fallow ground. And then the third one. For it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness upon us. How many know seeking the Lord is praying? Did you know seeking the Lord is praying? The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, he says, you're going to go and you're going to pray unto me and you're going to seek me and you're going to find me when you search for me with all your heart. How many see prayer connected with searching? Do you see it? Number one, we've got to sow to ourselves in righteousness and we will reap in mercy. Number two, we've got to break up our fallow ground. And number three, it's time to seek the Lord. How many see the three points we got today? But we got to turn the first two around because it's hard to sow when the ground is fallow. So you've got to have break up your fallow ground. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. And it's time to seek the Lord. So let's look at it in that order. Number one, what are we going to do for word of life, Christian church, to prepare itself for revival? Or we're just going to shout. No. Go see louder and faster. No. We're going to sing quieter and slower. No. It's time to break up your fallow ground. It's time for you to do something. Well, I'm just going to sing a little bit longer, and I'm going to shout a little bit louder, and I'm going to do it. No, you're not. No, 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 no. No, that's the result of it. Somebody said to me when I was a youth pastor back in Michigan many, 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 many years ago, way before I ever met him. They said, Pastor Jerry, you know what I found? They said, if you sing, if you sing all hail King Jesus, if you sing it seven times, the spirit will move. I thought, man, that's really. I, 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 I never heard that. But you know what I found out in later years? I found out this. That isn't true. 
even though I knew it, but that isn't true. But I did find this to be true. If the spirit moves, I'll sing it seven times. Has anybody got me? I said, is anybody with me? If the spirit moves, who knows how long you'll sing it. You might sing it all day long and you might not sing anything else. But don't you think it's the spirit of God that needs to move upon you and not you move upon the spirit of God? We don't use him. He'll use you. Stop trying to use him and let God do the initiating. We always want to initiate. Oh, I want to initiate. <laughs> let him do the initiating. Because when he initiates it, that's when things happen. That's when things happen. So, break up your fallow ground. What does that mean? Stir it up. Fallow ground was ground that was once prepared to receive the seed. But something happened. It lies neglected and it hardens up. What has hardened it? I don't know what it is for you, but I know what I wrote down when I thought about this some time ago. I wrote this down. What has hardened it? I tell you, it's spiritual sloth. It's secret sins and it's pseudo spirituality. It's time for us to find out what's causing your ground to be so hard. And I tell you, one of them, friends, it's a spiritual sloth. It might be a secret sin and it might be pseudo spirituality. What is pseudo spirituality? It's an outward profession without an inward possession. The Pharisees were like this they said, We are children of Abraham. We are children of the kingdom. Jesus says, no. No, you're not. You see, they were children of religion. They, they were children of religious mothers. They were children of religious fathers. They were children of religious teachers. But they had no experience of their own with a living Savior. It's time to break up our fallow ground. I'll leave it at that. Number two, it's time to sow in righteousness. That means sow righteousness. Sow righteousness. You break up your fallow ground, it's going to help you sow better. Well, I just like sowing seed, Pastor Jerry. Break up the ground or you're not going to get anything done. The devil's going to pluck it right off that hard ground. You've got to break it up. What does that mean? Get up here, repent, and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my spiritual sloth. Forgive me of those secret sins. And God, help me not to be soto in my spirituality. I don't want to be a fake fraud, phony, or foe about anything that I'm doing for God. Within this word righteousness are two others that are alluded to in the word righteousness. So to yourselves in righteousness is so rightness. In the word righteousness is the word straight. So he's saying this, it's time to live a straight life. And it's time to sow straightness. Straight line. Does anybody remember this verse? Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the Straight is the gate and narrow is the way. In other words, when you're walking a straight line, I didn't say perfect because nobody in here is perfect. Hallelujah. Boy, am I glad about that one. But you see, even though I'm not perfect, I'm going the right way. So the idea is boundary. That's the idea. So to yourselves rightness or straight lines or a straight gate. Or in other words, follow the word of the Lord. Stay within the confines of the will and word of God. And you will be a man or a woman who sows the right thing. Amen. What are you sowing? How many of you always reap what you sow? If you'll just sow the right, guess what will happen? You'll reap the right. Amen. He says you'll reap mercy. So this is a boundary thing. So in other words, a person who sows righteousness is a man of boundaries. Number two, he's a man of blamelessness. In other words, in the word righteousness is this. It's blamelessness. It's not perfection, but blamelessness. 
We're not talking faultlessness. How many know everybody here has faults? How many know there's not one of you in here that does not have faults? I have faults. I put my keys down right there, and I don't know where I put them. I said, Cameron, where's my keys? She says, right here. I said, oh, man. There are all of us who have faults. So we will always be faulty. But we can be blameless. We can be blameless. What's that? That has to do with your motive. Listen to the book, Ephesians 1 verse 4. Here's what he says. He says that you should be holy and without blame. Is that possible? He just said. Listen, pal. He just said it. That you should be holy and without blame. The Greek word and there can be said that is. That you should be holy, that is, without blame. Do you know what holiness is? It's when your motives are right before God. I want to ask you, what's your motive for being here? What's your motive, Pastor Jerry, for coming up here and preaching? What's your motive for singing? What's your motive for lifting your hand? What's your motive for giving in the offering? What's your motive for playing this piano? What's your motive for playing it? What's the motive? What is your motive? I don't know your motive, but behind every action you've ever committed is a motive. Yes. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not what? Someone help me. Love. What is love? It's a motive. Lord, check my motives. Today, check my motives. Check my motives. Check my motives. Let me tell you the difference between faultlessness and blamelessness. I was a youth pastor in Michigan many, many years ago, my, my brother Larry. And I had a car wash with my kids. Our drive in our church was gravel and sand. Does everybody hear that part? When your shoes are wet and you stand on sand and gravel... What gets caught up in the tread of your shoes? Sand and gravel. Okay. So we had a car wash. Kids were there, young people, youth group. One of the guys named Lee Sizemore, the boy, he had a younger brother named Jimmy. And Jimmy was about seven years old. And Jimmy came with Lee because he had to watch his brother, his little brother, so he had to bring him to the car wash. There was nothing else he could do. One of the guys in our church brought in, I didn't let him wash cars, but... One of the guys in our church bought a brand new, he was an over-the-road trucker, he bought a brand new Kenworth double sleeper, semi, black, black, that's even more pretty. And he drove that baby in there, and he says, I want you guys to wash my truck. I said, I, 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 I don't think so. It was $100,000 back in 1980 when he bought it. He said, no, no, you guys go ahead, go ahead. He, he's a member of the church. He said, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I want you guys to do it. It's okay. So him and I chit-chatted, standing on the side. I'm watching the kids, you know, wash the car, and him and I are talking. How, how many know you get to talking, and you don't really see what's going on? All of a sudden, his name was Terry. Of course, I'm Jerry. And he and I were talking. All of a sudden, we looked, and on top of the hood of that Kenworth truck, <laughs> was little Jimmy Sizemore standing with a big sponge going, and I'm like, ah, ah, ah. how many know I wanted to tear into that kid? Anybody know? <laughs> but Jimmy's seven. So you know what Terry did? He goes, Jimmy, Jimmy, look. And Terry says, Jimmy, don't move a muscle. And Jimmy's like, He says, look at Terry. He says, okay. He says, jump into my arms. And so Jimmy leaped off that truck, jumped into Terry's arms, and Terry sat him down, patted him on the head, and said, that's nice, Jimmy. Thank you so much. And Jimmy ran off. How many know Jimmy just wanted to help? He was not to be blamed. You see the difference? How many know he was at fault? How many know Jimmy shouldn't have done it? But his motive was not to do damage. His motive was to help the youth group wash a truck. How be it an expensive one. But nevertheless, how may see blamelessness. Because his motive as a little boy was to help. How many times have you known people to have a good motive, but they had lousy judgment? Come on. 
You don't want to raise your hand and admit it, huh? How many have had poor judgment and a lousy and, and a good motive? How many have had a lousy motive and a lousy judgment to go with it? Come on, you guys. It's time for us to sow the right boundary and we can be blameless before God if we will repent and say, Lord, help my motive to be pure. That doesn't mean I'm going to use good judgment all the time, Pastor. That doesn't mean I'm going to do it right. But I want you to know my heart is right. And if you'll let me know the truth, and if you'll help me, that pastor right there can lead you according to the word of God and bring you into a better relationship with him if you will let him do it. And the Holy Ghost is the initiator. Anybody got it? I hope you're not bored to tears. So number one, he's a man of boundaries. Number two, he's a man of blamelessness. But look at the result. And you will reap in mercy. How many of you always reap more than you sow? Come on, you do, don't you? Did you know that your mercies from God are greater than any misery you've ever had? His mercies are greater than your miseries. It's time to thank him for his mercies. So what does that mean? That means, my friend, that if you will sow in righteousness, you will reap more than you sow, and you will become a man of blessing. So he's a man of boundaries, a man of blamelessness, and a man of blessing. Is he perfect? No. But thanks be to God, he broke up that fallow ground, and now he can sow in a right direction with a good motive. Do you see it? How many know where that motive comes from? It comes from breaking up the fallow ground. And then it's going to affect your motive. It's going to affect you walking within the confines of the will of God. Your boundaries. How many know basketball is no fun without rules? Do you know that? Have you ever played basketball and they took off all the rules? You can jump on their backs, kick them, scream, and pull their hair and yank on them. How many know what I'm talking about? That's not just fun. Boundaries bring meaning to the game and the boundaries of his word will bring meaning to your life they'll bring power to your life they'll bring contentment to your life they'll bring liberty to your life I've never been so at liberty than when I lived within the confines of the will and word of God for my life I want you to know I'm the happiest man there is but his word is my rule of faith and conduct amen Amen. Well, don't go home yet. So lastly, it says, seek the Lord. Let me tell you, it's time to seek the Lord. This is where praying through comes. This is what I'm short on sometimes. It's time to seek the Lord until he rains righteousness upon us. Question. Three of them. What is it to seek the Lord? Number two. When do you seek the Lord? And number three, how long do you seek the Lord? It's all in there. What is it to seek the Lord? Well, let me just see if you remember this verse. Ask and it shall be. Seek and you shall. I'm not senile. You're probably saying, well, I don't know, Pastor Jerry. Maybe you are. No, I mentioned this, ask, seek, and knock in your church. A couple of times before. But you look at this. What is seeking the Lord? Well, it's it's just a greater form of asking. No, 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 no. No. Asking is prayer. Seeking is prayer. And knocking is prayer. They're all prayer. But seeking is not just another greater form of asking. No, 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 no. Asking is different than seeking, which is different than knocking. So what is seeking the Lord? It's, it's different than asking. Ask and it shall be given you. How many of God has things for you that are on the gift level? Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. The gift level. You can live your entire Christian life on the gift level, and you can go to heaven just the same and play on seven harps and have six visions and all that, and you can have a wonderful time. But I want to tell you, there's more than just the asking level. There is the seeking level. Yeah. What is the asking level? Well, listen, listen. You know what's on the asking, giving level? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal. You know what's on the asking level? Salvation. 
Aren't you glad? You don't have to earn it. You don't have to buy it. You can't do it. It's a gift. How many know that wisdom is on the gift level? We're walking around here so unwise and we don't know what to do. And God says, ask. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask. And he will give it to you. Stop going to the people who don't have the answer and go to the one who does. Just ask. Just ask. You guys doing all right? How many of the baptism in the Holy Ghost is on the gift level? How much more will your heavenly father give? He'll give. You, you don't buy that in. You can't earn it. Just come on up here and ask him for it. Well, I'm not going to ask him because he knows where I live. And, and since he knows where I live, he's just going to have to dump it on me. That's just the way it's going to have to be. But yet that's not how you got saved. When you got saved, you said, Lord Jesus, would you come into my life and save me? Whosoever will may come. It's on the asking level. Look what's on the asking level. How many know healing is on the asking level? Oh, thank God. The guy came to Jesus and said, would you heal my son? He said, where is he? Glory to God. How many know what I'm talking about today? Is anybody in the house today? I smell rain in the house. I said I smell rain in the house. But seeking is on a different level. Seeking is on a discovery level. Oh, that's different. How many of there are things you're going to ask for and you'll get, but you'll never get them unless you ask? Amen. But there are some things you'll get by seeking that you'll never get by asking. Now, don't get mixed up with the lingo. Amen. Lord, I'm seeking you. I'm seeking you. And God says, no, you're not. You're asking. You got the words mixed up. <laughs> and God says, since you didn't use ask, I'm not going to do it. How many know God knows when you say seek, you mean ask? How many know if you say ask, he knows you mean seek? Don't worry about the lingo. It's the attitude of your heart that matters. Glory. Glory. So seeking is on a discovery level. You guys doing all right? What does seek mean? It means to pursue. It means to search. It means to track down. I looked up a Latin word here and in Jeremiah 29, and, and, and part of the definition of that means this, to perceive by smell. And I thought, well, that makes sense because have you ever seen a dog tracking a coon? you ever seen them use hound dogs to track criminals? And they'll take... And what does the dog say? Get that out of my face. No, the dog says this. I got it. I got it. And then he seeks. Did you see? He seeks. He pursues. And he searches until he finds it. Woo! I tell you, there's something going on with this word smell, folks. I think we better get something right here. There's a smell, friend. I smell rain in the house. What are, you, what are you trying to say? I, 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 I'm trying to say whenever a cat, whenever a cat gets a whiff of a mouse, how many know the cat forgets everything else? And he or she goes after the mouse. True? You know how I know? Because of that little nursery rhyme? <laughs> pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? Does anybody know that one? Raise your hand if you've ever heard it. Four people. This is not going to go over well at all. Well, this is an old nursery rhyme, and it goes like this. Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? You have to say been because it's English. Britain. So, pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? And the, and the cat says, well, I've been to London to see the queen. They bought him a ticket on the boat and sent the cat over there to go see the queen. <laughs> Let me ask you, what would you come here for? Yeah. Really, I don't really care why you came. I know you're in the presence of God right now. Yes. Yes. Amen. But see, the cat knew why he went. I've been to London to see the queen. And they said, pussycat, pussycat, what did you there? And the cat said, well, you're not going to believe it. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a shame to tell you. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you there? And the cat says, I chased a mouse under her chair. I'm like, oh, no. Did anybody get it? 
How many know that the cat had a ticket to go to London to see the queen, and when he got there, he didn't even see the queen. He got sidetracked by a mouse. <laughs> Does anybody hear it? He smelled a mouse, looked around, saw it, and says, that's for me. And he went after it. And he didn't come there to catch mice. Friends, we didn't come to this church to catch mice. We came to see the king, the king of kings, and the lord of lords. And somehow, we get distracted on mice. We get distracted on petty things. We get distracted on stupid things. And we let it detour us from God's best, from what God has for us. And we're chasing mice. And I got to tell you, get your kids into a church like this and get them on to the scent of the presence of God and they will forget everything else and run after God. How many hear what I'm saying? Draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord, and I'll run after you. Why did the cat chase mice? Because it's in him. I said it's in him. You walk outside and you smell somebody's grill. All of a sudden you're like... I'm telling you, it happens to me. I love the smell of cooking hamburger. Do you like that? Cooking steak. Don't you love the steaks? Huh? He's sitting there going, I don't know who this man is, but he's making me hungry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when you get onto the scent of the spirit of the living God, if we can get our, if we can go like this to our kid. They need to come to an altar. They need to come to an altar and they need to see God move. You watch God move and that will put you on the scent of God's glory for your life. And it will help you to run after him. I hope I'm making sense to somebody. I smell rain in the house. Let me ask you, what are you smelling? So many times I've smelled things and I shouldn't be going after them. But that's because my nature is in there. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But if you can break up the fallow ground, sow to yourself in righteousness, he'll put you on the scent of something greater than you've ever seen or imagined in your life. So get back to number one so you can do number two so number three can help you pray through to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, my mom, bless her heart, could smell rain coming. And the incentive for her to run to the backyard and pull the clothes off the line, the incentive was the smell of rain in the air. And whatever that smell is in the air, let that be the thing that drives you to your heavenly Father. Amen. Oh, do you understand what I'm saying? Get a scent, a smell. How many have ever been to a bakery and you smelled cinnamon rolls? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I tell people in the church? This is what I tell them. They say, I can't feel the presence of God, Pastor Jerry. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, you guys are this and that and this and that. I, don't know. I said, you know what? There's a sweet presence of God at this altar. Why don't you come up, don't worry about it, just come up and sniff. I don't mean with this nose, I mean with this nose. Why don't you just come up to the altar and get into the presence of God and just let the Lord, watch somebody get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Watch somebody get baptized in water. Watch somebody kneel in prayer with tears going down their eyes. It'll do something for you. It'll do something to you. And it'll do something in you. Glory to God. Don't sit back there and watch them. Come on up and watch them up here. And watch God do something in your life. How, 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 how do you know that? I'm going to tell you how I know that. Because my daddy made me go to the altar every time. And I didn't like it. I wanted to stay in the back with my friends and play tic-tac-toe on an envelope out of the pew. 
but he dragged me up there, and I'm thankful that he did. Because you know what I saw when I went up there, Pastor Mark? I went up there, and I sat there, and I watched my brother Terry get baptized in the Holy Ghost, laying on his back. And I stood there like this, and I watched him, and God said, that could be you. That could be you. Your 25th anniversary, don't you smell anything? I said, it's your 25th anniversary. Don't you want God to bring rain in this house? Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me illustrate it this way. I was 17 years old. I was in Duran, Michigan, singing in a choir. What are you illustrating, Pastor Jerry? I'm illustrating what it is to seek the Lord. Praying through. Got it? Yeah. 17 years old, on a, on a platform in Duran, Michigan, singing in a youth choir, just kind of like you guys did. All those youth were up here singing today. It's good. All I do is close my eyes, and that's how you can tell. Anyway. And I was going to be a photographer. You could all laugh now. I had my own darkroom equipment. I had everything. I did everything. Loved it. But I'm standing on that platform, not thinking about anything, just worshiping the Lord in that choir. And the Lord spoke to me as sure as I'm standing here in this room. He said, I want you in Bible college. And that was it for me. I went home and told my parents I went to Bible college. At the end of my first year, I said, Lord, you made a mistake. How many know the Lord doesn't know it sometimes and you have to tell him? <laughs> and the Lord doesn't make mistakes, but I thought he did. And I said, you know, Lord, I said, I, I messed up my whole first year. At the end of my first year, I said, I'm ready to go home. But before I packed up my car and went home, because my dad told me I could come home anytime I wanted, before I packed up the car, I decided to get into my fifth floor dorm room and shut the door and turn out the light and sit there and pray what they called pray through. I had never done it in my life. But I was so determined to find out if God actually called me or not. And I'm here to tell you, I sat down in that room, I shut the door, and I just held my Bible open. I said, Lord Jesus, I said, I'm tired. I'm ready to leave. You got the wrong guy. I can't talk. I got a, I got a D on my first sermon that I preached in class. <laughs> and that about tore me up, which was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. So I said, Lord, you got the wrong guy. I said, but what, Lord, here's what I want. Isn't that something? I'm 18 years old. I was 18. I said, Lord, here's what I want. I want you to show me a scripture verse that I've never read before. And the Lord said, take your pick. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> So I was, I was waiting on the Lord, and, and I said that to the Lord. And I hadn't read much of the Bible. I knew the books of the Bible. I was raised in church, Pentecostal, all that. Don't go by your name or your pedigree. It's not that. It don't mean nothing. Because when it come time to think of a verse, I couldn't think of anything. But I will tell you this. The Lord put something in my mind. He put in my mind Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 6. It just came that way. Read Jeremiah 1, 6. It was in my thoughts. Did you know that God will speak to you through your thoughts? Did you know that? He will. Give him a chance. I thought, well, that's stupid. You just asked him to give you a verse you've never read before, and it's clear you've never read that one. So I decided, well, why not? I may as well read it. I opened up, and here's what it said. Ah, Lord God, Jeremiah said, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And I thought, well, that's about right. That's, it. that's how I feel. I'm 18. I feel like a squirt. Can't do anything. I don't know anything. God's not really called me. I said, but you know what, Lord, that doesn't help me. It don't help me. I just agree with it. That's all. <laughs> and the Lord said, read the couple verses ahead of that and read the verses after that. Because that's what they taught you in your first year of Bible college. So I opened up the Bible and I read the rest of it. And here's what it said. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew thee. 
Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Our Lord God, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for you will go where I send you, and whatever I command you, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to know, Pastor, I had an old-time Holy Ghost camp meeting in my dorm room I did I did and even now my heart is just pumping because of it even now my heart is stirred because of it you know why I'm going to tell you why because I have four brothers Larry Gary Terry Harry and I'm Jerry Now, if that's not a recipe for confusion, I don't know what is. But you see, I was the last of the five boys born. And when I, this is for the kids, no adults should listen. When I was born, my parents were hoping for a girl. (laughs) And they had a name picked out for this girl. And the name was Sherry. But Sherry never came, Michael. Sherry never showed up. Jerry bounded on the scene. (laughs) To which I tell you that my mother was so discouraged and depressed over it that she went into a spin, depression-wise. How would I know? I was only just born. And so people tried to cheer up my mother. And they sent her cards. And I brought three of them with me today. 1958, I was born. And these women, friends of my mother, wrote her notes to encourage her because what came was a boy and not a girl. (laughs) Let me read to you just a couple of lines. Dear Esther, that's my mother's name. Well, I'm so glad it's over for you. Now, my mother gave these to me about 30, 25 years ago or so. And when I read these, I about cracked up. She says, I want you to have these. I think you could use them. And I've been using them ever since. I'm so glad it's over for you. You disappointed everyone. These are encouraging words. I hope you understand. She says, but I did too. She had seven girls. Puts it in perspective, doesn't it? She says, but I did too. So I guess our Lord has his own ideas and knows what is best. And then she ends it this way. I called Wilma. I'm like, who's Wilma? Is that Fred's wife? You guys don't know who Fred and Wilma are either, do you? Man. You people need some different friends. That's all I got to say. (laughs) She says, I called Wilma, and she was disappointed for you too. With love, Bernie. And I'm like, what? So my mother really was encouraged by that, I see, I guess. But then someone sent her another one. This is the original. These are all original. It says this, extending a welcome that is warm and sincere to greet the new baby who is so precious and dear. And then she wrote a paragraph. You know, people can't let a card be the card. (laughs) Anybody know what I'm saying? They got to write something. You just can't help yourself, can you? You got to to express yourself. (laughs) Well, she does. And by the way, I preached her funeral not long ago, (laughs) the one who wrote this. But she said this on the bottom. He is just as precious. And she kind of ran out of room and then wrote, I'm sure. (laughs) That was an afterthought. I'm smarter than that. He is just as precious, I'm sure. (laughs) We don't understand why. Now, I thought you would laugh right there. (laughs) We don't understand why, but the Lord does. So we will leave it in his hands. We will leave it in his hands. 
still having trouble, aren't you there? <laughs> kind of hate to say it. Yeah. Come on, say he. Where you going? Just let us know. So we'll just leave it in his hands. The Lord bless you both and the new baby. Well, you know it's a boy. Can't you just say it? The Lord bless you both and, 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 and the new baby. Okay, well, we'll take it. Now, this is the last one. You're probably wondering why I'm doing all this. Because somebody out there needs to hear this. This lady wrote this to my mother, and she said, Dear Jack and Esther, may the sweet little baby so cuddly and new bring God's richest blessing to your home and to you. Great people write these cards. Then she wrote her paragraph. Can I, can I read to you her? Now, this paragraph got to me in a good way. We were so happy to hear of the safe arrival of another son in China. I'm like, you want to read that one again? She says, in China, you would be honored above all women for having so many sons. In China. Anybody got it? In China. Not here, but in China. Here? No. Over there? Yes. Now, now, I'm being facetious. Those people loved Chinese people, and they were missions uh, people, and they loved supporting China. So that's why it was in her mind. But the truth is, is that in China, it would be an honor to have had so many sons because that's what they want, our sons. So when I read that in China, you would have been honored, not here but there. And then she said this. You have such beautiful, well, healthy, and full of life boys. The Lord has been oh so good again. May you all enjoy this little new life entrusted to your care by our Heavenly Father. And then she says this. She says, may the hand of the Lord truly be upon this new son glory to god hallelujah because i feel his hand upon my life and i know one thing ladies and gentlemen i'm jerry and not sherry and you're probably asking why i'm gonna tell you why because I trust now in God's integrity that he knows what he's doing and he made you who you are supposed to be. Stop wishing you were somebody else and be the man and the woman of God he brought you to this earth to be because he's got a plan for your life. Hallelujah. And may the hand of God be upon him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Are you guys all right? Thank you, Jesus. You see, you might be struggling like I was. And you know what that just means because you're struggling with that? With the call of God, with who you are, with what's going on in your life. I don't care what it is. You know what that means when you're struggling? It just means this. It's time to seek the Lord. It's time to pray through. I prayed through in that dorm and praying through, seeking the Lord. I want you to know I found him. And he found me. Seek him. Seek him with all your heart. Track him down. Get the scent and follow it to its fulfillment. Because I'm smelling rain in the house. I'm smelling rain in this house. I believe God wants to do a miraculous thing in word of life. And you just have now begun. Yes. What is it to seek the Lord? Number two, when do you seek the Lord? When do you pray through? I could give you all kinds of stuff, and I'm not going to. I'm just going to give you one thing. You know when it's time to get to this altar and pray through, Pastor Mark? You know when it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and reigns righteous? You know when it's time to do that? I'll tell you when it's time. When you have been at a place like this. And you have seen God touch people's lives. 
You've seen God save people. You've seen God baptize them in the Holy Ghost. How many have seen people saved in this house? How many have seen people filled with the Holy Ghost? Do you know when it's time for you to seek the Lord? When you are in a church where that is happening and people's lives are being changed, it's time for you to get up here and start praying through. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's when it's time. Well, I just have to wait until I'm a little more emotional. I have to wait until I'm moved by the Spirit of God. Oh, I have to wait to see when God is in the mood. Let me tell you, God's in the mood. I said God's in the mood. God's in the mood this morning. God's in the mood to save you, sir, from your sins. God is in the mood to forgive you of all your trespasses. God is in the mood to fill you with the Holy Ghost. God is in the mood to deliver you from bondage to that thing that is holding you back in your Christian experience. It is time to seek the Lord. And friends, now is the time. But how long? How long? He says this. It is time. To seek the Lord. you got a tremendous opportunity in this church. There's no better time to seek the Lord than when you get into a place where people who have sought the Lord and have found him. Yes. Well, I think I'll go over there and seek the Lord. You know what? You can seek the Lord anywhere. But I tell you what. When my brother got filled with the Holy Ghost, I was standing right there. Yeah, hallelujah. 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 Last thing is, how long do you seek the Lord? He says, until he comes and rains righteousness upon you. How many know that's until is until? How long? Until. How long do I do this, Pastor? Until. I said, how long, Pastor Mark? I said, until. You know what that tells me, until? I wrote down a couple of things. Here's what it tells me. You grow weary in well-doing. And you say this, Pastor Jerry, I've been praying and nothing happens. I've been praying and nothing happens. I've been praying and nothing happens. Anybody know what I mean? When it says ask, seek, and knock, it means ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, and knock and keep on on knocking. In other words, it stands for faithfulness. We're so faithful to come to church. Well, hallelujah. That's a good thing. Let's be faithful to go to church. Let's be faithful to teach that class. That's what God's after. Let's be faithful in seeking his faith. Just a little harder. It's hard to see tangible proof and evidence and results. Oh, come on. I'm here to tell you, God doesn't live in time. I have not seen the things that God has prepared for them who will wait for him. We're too much in a hurry in this day and age. But even though the field seems barren, you keep seeking, you keep praying. How many have unsaved loved ones that need to have Jesus in their heart? Friends, now's the time. Don't stop. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. faithful. Now's the time to pray through to faithfulness. I want to pray through to healing. Yes, how about praying through to faithfulness? It's time to pray through to faithfulness. The Bible says it's required of stewards that a man be found faithful. That's the key. Remain faithful. The Bible says when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That word faith is faithfulness. When the Son of Man comes, what's he looking for? How rich you got. How many people you have in your church? No. He's looking for those who have been faithful. Because if you can be faithful in a few little things here, he'll make you faithful over many things over there. In other words, if you can't be faithful in a couple of things, you won't be faithful in many things. If you're too big to do small things, you're too small to do big things. What would you like me to do, Pastor? Pick up chairs. Oh, man, I wanted to preach. Sorry, pal. I clean bathrooms too. You wonder why your church is still here and thriving and doing what it's supposed to do? Because you have a pastor who prays through to faithfulness. This man and his wife are faithful. I'm not perfect, but my desire is to be faithful, sir. 
And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry unto him day and night? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nonetheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faithfulness on the earth? Shall he find the soul that continued to seek the Lord without ceasing? As I come to close this part of my message, and I'm done after this, I call this church to remain faithful to what you've been doing for him. Oh, Brother Jerry, I've been doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. I've been doing it and doing it and doing it. Oh, I'm doing the work, the work, the work, the work, the work. Let me tell you something. It's not the work you're doing for God. It's what the work is doing to you. It's not the, oh, I'm doing the work for Jesus. And God says, has that work you've been doing for me done anything to you? Yeah, it's made me annoyed at people. <laughs> Come on, it's true. Makes me wonder why they're here and here and here and here. Don't put that on the tape. Take that out if you can. It's not the work you're doing for God that counts. It's the what the work is doing to you that counts. God doesn't care as much where you are geographically as he cares who you are where you are geographically. I'm going to say it again. God doesn't care as much where you are geographically as he cares who you are where you are. Let's be faithful. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I close with this story. I'm going to call you up here for faithfulness in seeking God. But not just that. There was a factory in the east many years ago who was looking for an employee who would be faithful to the job that they asked them to do. And so they put a sign in the window, and it said, help wanted, pay every day, cash. Guy came by, saw the sign. He needed a job, so he took the sign out of the window, took it in. He said, here I am. And he said, oh, would you, you want to work? He said, yeah. He said, okay, what would you like me to do? And here's, they, here's what they said. They said, we want you to take this pile of bricks, you see, he goes, yeah, and carry them to the other end of this building and stack them up over there. He said, is that it? He said, yeah. The guy said, you ain't going to make a monkey out of me. I didn't come here to carry bricks. And he walked off. They took the sign, put it back in the window. Help wanted pay every day. Guy came by, saw the sign. Took it out, walked in, and they said, Oh, you would like to work? He says, yes. What would you like me to do? They said, well, come out here. You see that pile of bricks? We want you to take that pile of bricks and carry them all the way down there and stack them up. And at the end of the day, we're going to give you your pay. The guy said, okay. And so he picked up a brick, started carrying it, stacked it up, went back, got another brick. And about midway, he thought, what in the world am I doing? Are they going to make a fool out of me? I could be carrying brick. Carrying. What am I doing this for? He threw the brick down and walked off. Another guy needed work. Saw the sign in the window, grabbed it and said, I need a job. They said, all right. He says, what do you want me to do? They said, you see this pile of bricks? <laughs> Are you guys doing all right? <laughs> Don't worry, food's coming. All right. <laughs> they said, we want you to take that pile of bricks. We want you to move them all the way down there. So he took the brick and he moved it down there and he did this all day long and he got his pay and went home. And on his way home, he stopped at the grocery store because his family was in such need. And he bought food for his family, went home, held hands with his wife and his kids around the table, and prayed and thanked God for providing for their needs. Went back to work the next day. He said, all right, what do you want me to do today? They said, you see that pile of bricks? He said, yeah. They said, we want you to move them all the way down there. And I, he goes, what? He goes, well, I don't know, but if you're paying, I'm carrying and he carried him all the way down. He got his pay. He went home, bought some groceries for his family, fixed the food, sat around the table, held hands, and thanked God for providing for his needs. He went back to work. He said, what do you want me to do today? They said, we want you to take the bricks from down here, and we want you to carry them all the way down there. He says, you know what? This is the craziest job I've ever had in my life. He said, but you know, I kind of like it. <laughs> in fact, he started 
treating the bricks nicer. Because he didn't want to chip them. Because he thought to himself, this is the best job I've ever had. In fact, I plan on retiring from the brick carrying business. And he came in the next day after thanking God for providing for his needs. And he didn't even report that next day because he knew what they were going to ask him. <laughs> so he went right to work. La, 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 carrying these bricks. Man, it's the best job I ever had. Thank God for giving me this job. And all of a sudden, the foreman came out and said, hey, the boss wants to see you. He says, oh, no, I did something wrong. I should, I should have gone in and asked first. He just went and did it. He knew he made a mistake. So he goes into the office of the big cheese man. And the guy says, where have you been? He said, well, I was out carrying bricks. He says, no, 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 that's not what I mean. Where has a guy like you been? He says, this big company has been looking for someone who will do what they have been asked to do with a teachable heart and do it without complaining. And we finally found you. He hit the buzzer, and in walked the tailor. Measured his neck, measured his arms, measured his waist. Came back about three hours later with a suit and a tie and a white shirt. And made him the vice president of the company. <laughs> you guys soon on? Probably looked as good as me right here. <laughs> Probably not. At least as good as your pastor. He's walking home with his briefcase. Walked a little different than he did before, you know. And he went past uh, uh, Floyd's Barbershop. Does anybody know that? Nobody watches Andy Griffith. Nobody knows Floyd the Barber. All right. <laughs> he goes past the barbershop, and there were those friends of his. And they said, hey, John, what happened to you? He says, oh, he says, I, he said, where'd you get that suit? He says, I, it's the craziest thing. He says, I went into this place. He says, it's just funny. He says, and there was this sign that said, help wanted to pay every day. And he says, and so I went in there, and, and, and they said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He says, and next thing I know, I carried these bricks and carried the bricks and carried the bricks. And next thing you know, I'm out wearing this suit, and they made me the vice president of the company. And the guy said, are you kidding me? He says, no, that's what happened. Those were the three guys that had been in there before. And they said... Hey, wait a minute. We had those same bricks in our hands, and we threw them away. And those men kicked themselves because they wouldn't do the little thing and be teachable and faithful to God. Can we say it that way? But if you will understand this, it's not the work you're doing. It's what the work is doing to you. And never forget this. It's not the job you're doing. It's whether or not you're faithful to it. You know what? God's looking for piano players and drummers and singers and preachers and teachers and, and people who come in to support and sing and be in these chairs. You know what God's looking for? Your faithfulness. Because God knows that at the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be a whole lot of kicking going on of ourselves because we didn't and we're not faithful to the little thing that God called us to do and to be. And I'm here to tell you, just be faithful to do what God has called you to do in this church. And I'm here to tell you, I has not seen, ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And what is love? It is the motive for what you are doing for God. Does anybody hear what I'm saying in this house? What I'm saying is there's not enough deacon jobs so everybody can deek. <laughs> I want to be a deacon. Well, that just disqualified you. Right, right. That's right. Stop wanting and start being faithful. And let God be the one that chooses what you ought to do because he knows the job that you do will make you into the man or woman you're supposed to be in a way that no other job could. Anybody hear what I'm saying? I ran from this. I ran from this call, Pastor. But God has used it in my life, Brother Holland Ball, 
to bring out of me the garbage and the junk that's in my life so he could fix me and make me into the man he wants me to be. And I'm not there yet, but I've got to be faithful, Matthew. I've got to be faithful. Be faithful and play in this thing. Be faithful and be in here. Because there's not enough superintendent jobs so everybody can soup. There's not enough teaching jobs so everybody can teach. There's not enough whatever, whatever, so everybody can whatever, whatever. So I call this church to faithfulness. You have the bricks in your hand right now after 25 years of brick laying. Why not just keep carrying bricks and watch God do something miraculous? Because I smell rain in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm done. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Now with your heads up and your eyes open, how many have the guts to admit that you need to be seeking him more than you have been? You need to be getting on your face more than you have been. How many with your heads up and your eyes open will lift your hand and say, I need to be more faithful than I have been. Come on, you guys. How many need to be more faithful? How many know it's time to break up your fallow ground? Anybody need to break up your fallow ground? Lift your hand. How many need to start sowing the right thing and not gossip? Start sowing the right thing and you'll reap mercy. And you know what? We need to start seeking the Lord and praying through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you all stand with me today? I got one more question. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You're here today and you'd say, Pastor Jerry, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And it's my desire to surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ today and begin my faithful journey in following Jesus. Would you lift a hand right now? Lift a hand. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Anybody? I need Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. Anybody else? I need Jesus. Lift your hand. I need Jesus. I'm going to ask you who raised your hands. We love you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And friends, here's what it takes. Number one, admit you're a sinner. Number two, believe that what Jesus did on the cross is the only remedy for your sin. And number three, confess your sin and ask Jesus, come into my heart and I will be a follower of you. I'm tired of the life I'm living. I'm sorry for the sins I've committed and it's time for me to follow you, Jesus. You raised your hand. I'm asking you to come. Everyone in this house who raised their hand, I'm going to ask us to come. As a family, 25 years is just the beginning. Friends, it's time to do a little more brick laying, a little more brick carrying, and watch God do something that you never dreamed of. How many need to carry some bricks? Let's sing it. Whatever they're singing, come as they sing. And don't hesitate. Come on right now. Those who raised your hand to be saved, I want to meet you here. I want Pastor Mark to pray for you here. Come on up. Just you don't have to wait for the music. Just come on up. Anybody want to come? Only a ton of us raised our hands. I call the church. If you, lift, if you, if you lifted your hand, come on up. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? How about those of us who raised our hands to be faithful? How about you coming? How about those of us who raised our hands because we're slacking and we need to be more faithful? How about you coming? It's kind of funny. I, I thought you raised your hand. I, I thought I saw it. I, I saw the hand. I, I saw the hand. How about show God the heart? How many know that would be a good thing? I, you don't have to. Hey, just do it right where you're standing then. But you know what? Tell the Lord about it right where you are. But because tell the Lord about it right where you are. Done, Just tell the Lord about not it. Because of what Lord, of those I've of us who are standing in our chairs and standing at this altar, we now surrender ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, help me to be more faithful. Help me, Lord Jesus, to be more faithful. Help me, Lord Jesus, to pray through. Help me, Lord Jesus, to seek your face more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I give you praise today. Thank you for this church. Hear me when I'm calling. Thank you, Jesus. Thank Lord, you, Jesus. Catch me when I'm falling. You look beyond your faults, all your knees. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, yes. 
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. That the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love. Oh, Jesus, we come to seek your face. And watch me rise again. Who am I? Spirit. 
today knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please understand, don't leave out of here unsaved. Don't leave out of here unchanged. The Lord Jesus wants to save you. If you'll open your heart unto him and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I repent of my sins. Yes, Lord, I receive you into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Hallelujah. Spirit of God is drawing your heart. The Spirit of the Lord is touching you right now. He's tugging on you. You know it. He's tugging. Don't resist him. Surrender to him. Don't push God away. Don't push God out of your house. Don't push God out of your heart. But open up your house to him. Open up your heart to him and say, Lord, I give you my all. I surrender. I'm not running away anymore, but now I'm running to Jesus. I'm running to you. People here, people watching Hundreds and hundreds of people watch. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're suffering. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe God wants to save you. I know he does. He does. Hallelujah. Would you surrender? Would you surrender now? Praise God. Would you pray with me? If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I want to know Christ as my Savior. you got to believe that he's the Son of God. You got to believe that we're sinners and need saving from our sins. You got to believe that Jesus died on the cross and gave his life and shed his blood for us to be saved. On the third day, he rose from the grave. He sits at the right hand of the Father right now. But before I got saved, I had to admit I was a sinner. I had to admit that I needed salvation. And so that's what happened. I confessed that to the Lord and I repented of my sins. Nobody forced me, nobody made me. It was a decision, a choice I made. And maybe maybe that's you today. Maybe that's you today. It's a choice. Nobody's forcing you. Nobody's making you. But God gives us the opportunity. So I want you to pray with me as I pray this prayer. But it's not so much the prayers it is the, as Brother Jerry touched on, the attitude of the motive of the heart. I'm surrendering my will to God. If you're here today, you can pray with me. Or those that are watching online, you can pray with me as well. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came to this earth and died on the cross and shed his blood for me. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. I know this, Lord Jesus, that I am a sinner and I know I need salvation. I'm asking you, Lord, right now to help me, Father, because by choice... I choose to repent of my sins. I'm going to turn away from my sins. I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me of all of my guilt, all of my past, all of my sins, everything, Lord. I'm asking you right now, please forgive me. Cover them with the blood of Jesus Christ. I know and I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart. He's the Son of God. I'm asking you by faith right now, according to your word, to come into my heart and to come into my life, Lord Jesus, and save me. Save me, oh God. Cleanse me, Father, of all my sins. Wash me, oh God, I pray. Make me whole. Make me new. Make me yours. God, I thank you for the promise, and I thank you for the cross. And I thank you, Lord, because according to your word and by faith, not by works, right now, I am saved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for washing me. Thank you for making me whole. I ask this all now by faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, you prayed something like that. God sees, God knows your heart. If you're sincere and you're genuine, then right now, by faith, everybody that made that decision is saved. That's it. The Bible says that angels rejoice over one sinner that repents. One sinner. Heaven is rejoicing. I'm going to say this, that I believe, and I think you would agree, that time is short. Time is short. We're not promised tomorrow. No, we're not. But I know this. For those who accepted Christ as their Savior, you're promised eternity with Jesus. To be absent of the bodies, to be present with the Lord. You can't get to heaven by works. You can't get to heaven by good deeds. If my good outweighs the bad, that doesn't do it. It is solely putting your faith and trust 
in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God and what he did for you. Jesus on the cross took your sin and that sin was judged so that you and I would not have to take the judgment. But now we're filled with the peace of God that passes all understanding. We have the love of the Lord that fills our hearts. We have the joy of Jesus. Hallelujah. The burden and the weight of sin has been lifted. And now you've given, you've been given new life. New life. Praise God. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You were spiritually born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Man, praise God. That's good stuff, folks. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Wasn't that good preaching? Huh? Wasn't that good preaching? Huh? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pastor Jerry, fantastic word and so timely. Sister Karen, to us such a blessing. Man, I tell you what, what a what a special day to have all of us here together like this. I want to thank you so much from all of my heart, my wife and I, for everybody coming. It really means a lot to us. Now, we're going to do, we're going to rearrange things, okay, so we can prepare for our meal. So I'm going to need some help, okay? So what's going to happen here is Brother Scott's in the back over there. We're going to move tables out and the round tables, all the tables out. There are two tables downstairs that need to come up and the chairs that these two tables come out, all these chairs are going to be stacked up about four or five high, and they're going to go into that room after the tables are taken out. All right. Not over. We have more to do. These chairs on this side, the first three chairs from this row over, stack them up on the fourth chair. We need that much room. Three chairs on this side, on this aisle, stack them up on the fourth chair and leave them there, Okay. So if I can have some strong guys here helping us out. Ladies, ladies, listen, ladies. We're going to, this is what we're going to do. Downstairs, you're going to bring up the food and set everything up in this room, okay? After we eat, there's going to be a slideshow while we're eating. But after we eat, we're going to have a water baptismal service, okay? So don't take off and don't leave. And then afterwards, we need help putting everything back together, okay? Please help us do that, okay? All right? Let's pray together, okay? Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray over our food. Let's pray God's blessing, okay? Heavenly Father, as we come to you in the name of the Lord, I thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for the service. I thank you for the preaching of the Word of God. And I thank you for those that responded, for those you touched, for those you changed, for those you saved, to those you've forgiven, to those you've revived, to those you've renewed. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That you breathe a, a, a breath of hope into their heart and life. We thank you, God. Lord, I pray for the continued time together. The food, bless it, sanctify it. Lord, I pray that you'll use it for the nourishment of these bodies, for your service and for your glory. Thank you for all that came. Thank you for all that gave. Thank you for all that brought. And I just ask you to bless every family, giving you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be careful with spills on the floor, with your food. All the food will be in here, okay? We'll get things set up. All right. Make sure you pick up all your belongings in the chairs. Anything under the chair, pick it up. Anything in the rack, take it out. Hallelujah. We got plenty of food. We got plenty to eat. It's going to be great. Give us about 15 minutes, okay? Take me back to the place that feels like home. See me. 